he was a very inspired artist and just like when he writes songs he just uh, he didn't labor on it he was not a laborious artist you know, he just did things when he felt like you know he just expressed himself um, when he felt like well we influenced each other but it's not so much the influencing but sort of uh, it just rubs off on you, you know. And um, I think that um, Paul and John both uh, were actually aware of people like Stockhausen and John Cage, their work. I mean, they were in the forefront of music, so of course they're, they're going to be aware of all, all different types of music that's going around at the time. And, um, and at the time, I think, knowing Stockhausen and John Cage was pretty good. Their work, that is. And I came into the picture, and of course, it was like, you know, um, let's talk to each other time, you know. <laughs> so of course, he's going to think all different, uh, very avant-garde ideas and express them. It reminded him of his roots and his childhood and all that. And so that uh, he became in touch with himself. And of course, that helps, I suppose, you know. But that, that's something that he did himself. In other words, I was just, you know, it could have been anything that came into his life, you know, like a train or something. <laughs> but I was that happened to be that train, that's all. The experiment records, we had fun with it. Uh, and at the same time, um, I think we did cross the barrier, or cross the barrier is not a good word, but bridged uh, between avant-garde jazz and rock or something with that just one album, actually. So we were pretty sort of like hot about it, you know, at the time. Though the world didn't share our feelings. <laughs> okay, well, you know, I think that the work um, creates its own value, and I'm not the one who should put a value on it, really. I don't know what the value is. I think it's up to the people, in a way. But uh, uh, I think that the young generation is really into that stuff, you know? So it might, might be interesting. I don't know. It's just I see, I see that that side of work that we did uh, have inspired some people, you know, down the line. Yes, naturally, it's time for me to record another album. But um, Starkey's was just such an incredible hard thing that came in, you know? <laughs> I don't know if you share the feeling or not, but, you know, yet again. But yes, it was a powerful sort of experience. And so I'm giving you time to, you know, let it sink in, and then I'll bring out the next. I'm in a sort of fortunate position of being free. I know that there are many sort of intellectuals who would love to have a, a, a kind of uh, a library or something where they can go and check it out. That could happen in the future. But I also know that most people are not like that. And most people like to see a film made into something that's more acceptable, you know, like a, a drama or something like that, and see it like that. So um, I'm asking David Volker to make this documentary film of uh, the sort of like a, a, the definitive Lenin. And he's doing that now. Documentary film, and so all the footages, I just sort of said, okay, you learn of this, you know, and that way, uh, the sort of part that communicates, he will select all the parts that communicates with the mass, you know, and that will be coming to you. And I thought that's the best way. Anything that is not selected, well, you know, it's a blessing in a sense that uh, uh, that will be for the next film. You know what I mean? So. I see what, what is being used and what's not being used, and the ones who are not, which are not used will become a, become an expert. I have never thought of myself as a curator, <laughs> and I never will, you know. I'm not doing that. Um, for some reason, and I'm sure there's a good reason for it, but um, unknown to me, a good reason unknown to me, uh, I'm in a position where um, I have the controlling rights to all the things legally. And so I have to be very caring about that right, you know, in the sense that 
I don't want to misuse it. And also, I don't want to be too frightened to you. Not use it. You know, it's like, I don't want to just hold on to everything and not share it with you, you know. Mm -hmm. But then, how am I going to share it with you? I mean, there are ways of doing it. And there's a time to do it as well. So that's a consideration, that's a responsibility. And uh, that, I, I will be doing that uh, in a way that I think is right for me to do. So this is like, you know, part of that kind of activity in a way. And people say, well, why do you want to do this, you know? And um, it's true that I could just be sitting in Dakota like where the God is. That was a choice that was given to me. And the other was to just keep on communicating like John and I used to. And that was more something that I preferred, you know? Because it was like us again. And also, why don't we communicate? Why do we stop communicating? Yeah. There was no reason for it. I felt that <sighs> that's something that I have to do, and I want to. And of course, a lot of uh, people did feel that I shouldn't be doing it. And I heard that too. But uh, you know, how many times do I hear anything negative about me? And I got used to it. You know? <laughs> so I hear that, and I hear the other too, which is some positive encouragement. And I go with that. That's where he rediscovered love, love for life, you know? And love for life is very close to love for art and love for expression. I mean, it's all connected, you know? So you got to go back there and really get that love, that feeling of love in order to create. Well, if I'm not more conservative, or if I'm not 80s, then I, I'll be dead, I'm sure, you know? I mean, people have a strange kind of uncanny uh, way of uh, surviving, you know, and I think that as a mother, and for myself too, actually, but I think that I have the responsibility to survive. And also, communication is something that you do. It's two way street, you know. It's not. It's not like you tell in exactly the way you want to tell and expect them to understand it. And I think you have to have a certain level of understanding about the other side too, you know. Well, it was all dialogue, let's put it that way. And also, the kind of flack I got, I don't think it was a personal experience. I mean, think that it's the kind of experience that we all went through together. For once, I think it was a teaching for all of us. I hope that through the, the pain that I went through and through seeing the pain that I went through, that you might have a different understanding about uh, different races in the world, or about women, or about Orientals. I don't know. Maybe we are much more together and similar to each other than we thought we were, you know? That kind of thing. And I think the whole world had to learn together. And that's the pain that John and I went through. But it was not that personal, let's put it that way. I think there was a definite strong need for you guys to uh, have a dragon lady around in the world, you know, and, and it happened to be me. But then what it is, like I said before, it was a kind of experience that was created for a great teaching for all of us. And I happened to be part of it, but it really was not a personal thing. You did not hate me personally. You did not see that I was a dragon lady personally. You can see dragon lady, a dragon lady, uh, out of uh, a necessity, out of uh, um, a need within you, or a desire within you, to want that oriented person to exist in this world, you know? Somebody said, well, it was just the times, and everybody was working for the same thing. I think there was a slight difference in that, uh, because we were laughed and were attacked for it, so I might as well take the credit for it too, or we might as well take the credit for it too, that we really believed in peace and love, and with peaceful methods. And a lot of uh, people in the movement were thinking that maybe they have to go on a violent route, you know? So for that, we, we got a lot of black things. I think that, uh, 
in hindsight, I'm, I'm glad that we insist on peaceful methods. And also that it's coming to a point now that we're entering an age of wisdom. Now we know really that nothing can be solved by violence. In fact, we can't use violence anymore to solve anything. So we will have to use our wits, our wisdom. And that's what we foresaw then. And in a way, um, it's starting to happen. And I'm very glad. I essentially approve the use of the song for many reasons. One is that um, I think that it's great that John's song, without any deletion or any change, that is sung uh, fully, and that that particular media gave that uh, space for that song to be played uh, in the original form, and I really love that, because uh, a lot of young people are now discovering uh, that song through that medium. And also, too, uh, now they're saying, oh, Jones Revolution and Nike is just a, you know, just sneakers, isn't it, or something. But I think that I want to correct that misunderstanding that we have now, which is like, but John was saying revolution, the real macho revolution. No, it wasn't. It was uh, a new way of life. It was uh, to um, accept a holistic way of life, you know? And it was precisely that. You wear sneakers, wear casuals, and, and uh, take care of your health or whatever, you know? And uh, go into sports or whatever. So we were talking about that kind of revolution, not uh, blood and uh, tears, you know? And, and that's what I wanted to show to the world. I have to just sort of do whatever I can, you know? And right now, this is what I, I'm able to do, you know? And um, I, I believe in divine timing, which means that everything, everything has its divine timing uh, that sort of supersedes my judgment, etc. You know, so I'm just leaving it to the wind, so to speak, and something will probably come good, but it's not something that I'm, uh, I'm feeling the need to push. Meeting cards, and right now it's coming out. <laughs> yeah, just, uh, yeah. It's true. Well, that's just, you know, being facetious as well. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know of any media that I haven't tried yet. You tell me, and I'll just jump on it. <laughs> a playwriting card. Oh, that's a good one. <laughs> you know, I'm, this is funny that John and I ex sort of share that kind of experience or feeling, you know. And John was one day sort of looking at a New York book review, you know, that's sort of looking at and say, just looking very angry. He said, what are you angry about? And he said, well, my book is not in this book job, you know. I said, but you haven't written a book, so, you know, right. <laughs> you know, and it's like that. In our minds, we always thought of ourselves as playwrights as well, of course, you know. And, uh, but you haven't seen my play yet. <laughs> so, the time will come. <laughs> John was an art student, art student before he became uh, a rocker. You know that. So I think so. He had this feeling like he wants to sort of um, do a gallery show, one man show. Yeah. And he told me that when we got together, I always wanted to do one man show. Okay. No. I know if you can do it. So, no, I don't think so. You can do it. You know, like that. And you'd be surprised how modest he is. He's a very, he has a very modest side. You know, he had a very modest side. You know? He never thought that he could, because he thought that, you know, you have to be totally appreciated as an artist to get a, a gallery show. You know, like getting a gallery show is such an honor, you know? And never occurred to him that all you had to do was go to Robert Fraser and say, hey, I want to do a gallery show, you know? <laughs> and I don't know if he wanted to do it that way either, you know, he wanted to be accepted by the art world and get this honor to do a gallery show, uh, which never happened because he was already famous and he always got a gallery show for some other reason. That's how he felt, you know? So now I think just slowly people are going to start seeing that it's great, you know, whether he 
was John Lennon or not, it's great. That's where it's going to probably uh, go to. But it takes time. I think that he would have approved of this kind of show because uh, if only for the fact that it's not done just in New York and in a museum, you know what I mean? Like I'm going to all the different cities and saying hello, you know? It's like very, it's something nice about it, something people about it, you know? The kind of thing that he was against was like be becoming a statue, you know? Or being put in a museum uh, where, you know, like people wouldn't want to go anyway, but just a, a few curators would think that it's great, like, you know? I mean, he was against that sort of thing. So I think he likes the fact, I think he would have liked the fact that you guys just come here to enjoy it. He was human enough to say, hey, that's great, you know, on one hand, you know? I mean, we're all human, you know? And I wouldn't say that, you see, he, like, he was very upset about um, sort of like the snobbery of that whole scene, the museum, you know, curator, you have to know a curator, you know, connection, that sort of political scene or whatever. But if some museum called him up and said, uh, your pieces in a museum, uh, we just acquired it and it's uh, being displayed, you know. He might just say, wow, <laughs> you know, let's take Sean and go see it, you know. <laughs> so I'm just saying he was human, you know, but basically he was not the kind of person who was just that, but loved this as well, you get it? And I love of it, you know, loved a lot of this. I don't want to go into the sort of talk about spirit and all that bit because mainly because it, it would be misunderstood and and I, I really think that that area is the only area now that I call personal, you know. And uh, but I really think that uh, he's probably too busy to be sad, <laughs> you know, or lonely. Uh, he's more concerned with what's going on in the world than you think of his spirit body. Well, it's not just the art galleries and uh, John's, uh, well, I mean, it's John's songs as well and all sorts of things, but uh, it's nice to sort of do it because it's like he's still here and we're still together or whatever we're doing, you know. So there's that side of it, it's nice. You see, it was a different time. In other words, um, Woodlake was complimentary to him at the time because his records were not sold as much, you know? People weren't buying his records as much. So whatever way people get his song, it's people are great, you know? So he did make comments like, oh, Woodlake's great. But on the other hand, he made comments like, um, and this was in fact in 1980, just before he went, but he was saying, uh, we have to get all those outtakes in Capitol Hill must be good. Because I know that when one of us dies, they're going to put it out. And so well, that's an impossible you know, because we can't do it. But I don't know why he thought of it, but he thought of it. Now, in other words, one part of him, him is such an astute artist that, and such a perfectionist that he doesn't want anything other than the remix that he approved of to go up. But the other part of him is thinking, anything, you know, <laughs> let's communicate with anything, right? So, understanding it, that's how he was. I don't know if I'm going to die or not, so I'm not there. <laughs> I don't think uh, it matters. I hope it wouldn't matter, because I hope that people then would be so involved with their happiness and joy that they don't want that. <coughs> we went through everything, <laughs> and um, that I don't want you to go through. <laughs> and <coughs> that was another learning process. And I think that the young, the very young generation, Sean's generation, very healthy. Their thinking is very healthy. They don't want any drugs. They're, they don't even want cigarettes, you know. And 
that's why I have to stop smoking. <laughs> you know, so it's great. And I think the next age, or shall we say the future, which will come very soon, future can be now, but it's going to be beautiful. We're all going to be wiser, and we are wiser. When you know about the mercury and the Venus, and then you have to know about the numerology and um, the Japanese astrology and all that, and between it all, it's fine. So when you, you see, when you just know one thing, you know, then it becomes difficult. But it's, you have to remember that just that's just one part, you know. And as a whole, it's okay. And I think that Mercury retrograde is very good sometimes for uh, remembering things and, and creating um, all the, uh, re reliving all the emotions and all that. And that, I think, will help this show, definitely. And also, if you're really into astrology, you learn how to use all the uh, benefits of different animals, different combinations. You know? So, Mercury retrograde is usually considered like the, the worst time to do anything. But then it has its own component that's very good, you know? And you can use that. Because otherwise, half of your life, or, you know, uh, one tenth of your year is the only time that you can do something. <laughs> so you have to know how to use all the elements. You know? This is how he was, you know, his spirit, you know, like so going, hey, you know. And I just love it because of that, you know. I think that uh, this new music trend, you know, is interesting. The new, uh, new age, new age music, you know. I mean, that's going to go very far. Mm -hmm. And we go to a point where science and music meet, you know, in a sense that music becomes just vibration, which helps our growth and health. And it would go to that point. So it's interesting. I mean, it's an effort to uh, get into the charts, and it's very difficult that that too. So I respect them, you know. There was an incredible strong dialogue about it, negative and positive, you know? And I think that dialogue really helps people to be aware of the concept of selfies. But, I mean, you know, I wish it hadn't been like that, you know what I mean? But it's always like that. It's always, it comes not as a straight blessing, but it's like a blessing in disguise, you know? And I think it worked, you know? It's my 32nd birthday, and I want to say it was a pleasure. Okay, thank you. Happy birthday. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I love you. I will place the video of this is the video from Mayor Penny of Denver, attending today's Denver Day. In, uh, <laughs> Thank you.